much. That sounded really nice. Thank you, choir. You may be seated. Thank you, Dale. Thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us this morning at Fellowship Bible Chapel. Our guest today from Oriel Ministries is Jacob Prash. He's going to talk about a broken cistern. Once again, good morning, dear friends, and greetings in Jesus. Turn with me, please, to the Hebrew prophet Jeremiah. Yeremiah Huhanavi Perek Bet, Jeremiah chapter 2. One of the most incredible and important prophecies in the Old Testament in the Tanakh. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, to who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that can hold no water. Let's begin with my people. When we read John 1.12, he came to his own, his own would not believe, but to those who did believe, he gave the right to become the children of God. There is a distinction between the people and the children. I live in Great Britain. In Great Britain, we have a peculiar situation that doesn't make sense to a lot of people who don't live in a British Commonwealth country. Prince Charles is the future King of England, God help us. <laughs> His father is of Greek descent. His mother is half Scottish and half Hanoverian German. He's not even an Anglo-Saxon, genetically, anthropologically. Yet he is going to be the king of England, but at the present moment, he is legally the Prince of Wales. Doesn't have a drop of Welsh blood in his veins, no Welsh DNA whatsoever, none but he's the Prince of Wales. He's not one of the people, but he reigns. Why? Because he's a son. The Jews are the people of God. They remain the people of God, according to Romans chapter 11. The Jews are the people of God. But that does not necessarily mean that they are a child of God. A Jew who believes is a child of God, but they're a faithful remnant. They're a faithful remnant. How can a non-Jew, how can somebody who is German descent, or Asian descent, or Hispanic descent, how can they co-reign with Christ in the millennium and be with God forever when they're not one of God's people? How can they be, as it were, grafted in? Because they are sons or daughters. No, the Prince of Wales is not Welsh, but he's the prince because he's the son. You may not be a Jew, but you will co-reign with a Jewish Messiah because you are a son or a daughter. In the case of Prince Charles, it is by birth. In the case of believers who are not Jewish, it is by second birth. But it's always by birth. A difference between people and children. Most Christians don't get this. The Jews are the people of God. Believers are the children of God. A Jew can be a child, but most of them aren't. They're just the people. Well, Jeremiah's prophecy is twofold. He says that God's people are going to commit two evils. The first evil they will commit is to forsake the fountain of living waters. Now, we have to understand the meaning of living waters. Maim hayim. Maim hayim. In John chapter 7, verses 38 and 39, we see that maim hayim is the Holy Spirit. 
In John chapter 4, Jesus told the Samaritan woman at the well, I will give you my mayim, living water. It draws on the millennial imagery of Ezekiel 47. The Holy Spirit is the living water. Now when we look at John chapter 7, the background is something we teach about on our tape, Simcha Torah, on our teaching recording, Simcha Torah. It is the Hebrew feast of Simcha Bet HaShoiva. Simcha Bet HaShoiva, described by Josephus and in the Mishnah, matching the New Testament record exactly and supported by archaeology. At present, the original pool of Siloam, Shiloak, is about 80% excavated, the very pool with the steps where Jesus would have walked. And leading from it up the city of David to the Temple Mount is the processional stairway where the Levites would have taken water containers in the Simcha Bet Shoiva ceremony, it was a ritual, and brought the water containers up to the Temple Mount, singing Psalms of Ascent in the Hebrew liturgy for that day, the Machzor for the Feast of uh, Simcha Bet Shoiva, which was the Feast of Tabernacles. Hag uh, uh, Sukkot, Hag Sukkot, the Feast of Boots. Singing the songs of ascent, no matter what direction you approach Jerusalem from, you're always going up. Let's go up to Zion, let's go up to Zion. Na Aletziona, na Aletziona, na Aletziona, Kiryat Melekrav. Sing hallelujah, shir hallelujah. You're always going up to Zion, okay? I rejoiced when they said to me, let us go up to the house. You're always going up, okay? Uh, and they carry, the Levites would have the choir singing these psalms of ascent, carrying the water and pouring it out on the pavement, on the Temple Mount, on the Gabbatha. And it was against this background in John 7 that Jesus says, whoever's thirsty, come to me, I'll give living water. But John 7, 38 and 39, this he spoke of the Holy Spirit. So the first evil, as we explain on the Simcha Torah tape, the next day after the seventh day of the feast is the feast of uh, Simcha Torah, the joy of the Torah. The Jews are dwelling in booths this whole week reading the book of Ecclesiastes. God's philosophy of life, Kohelet, the Megillah Kohelet. Don't trust in this life, it's all in vain. That's God's philosophy of life. Love God and keep his commandments. If you trust in this world and this life, you're going to be disappointed. It's all vanity. Vanity of vanity, says the preacher. You know, it's wonderful. In the Vulgate, it says, vanitas, vanitatem, amie vanitas. Even the Catholics know it. <laughs> it's all in vain to trust in this life. So it's against this background, Jesus says he's the one who gives the living water. He gives the Holy Spirit. This is not a new imagery. Remember the rock followed them, Paul says, and the rock was Christ, and they struck the rock, the water came out? He always gives the Holy Spirit, the living water, the Maim Hayim, always him. The first evil his people, Israel, would commit is Israel and the Jews would reject the fountain of living water. They'd reject the Messiah. They would reject the one who would give the Holy Spirit. They'd forsake him. Only a remnant would believe. Their second evil, just as evil, to who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. They would invent another religion and pretend it's the same one. They would invent another religion and pretend it is the same one. That was the second evil. The first evil was to reject their Messiah, who would give the living water. But the second evil was they'd begin another religion. What is today falsely called Judaism is actually rabbinism. Find another name for it. Talmudic Judaism is not Levitical Judaism. It is not mosaic, it is rabbinic. It is not scriptural, it is Talmudic. 
It's not Levitical Judaism. It is a false Judaism who keeps the same name. Quite a thing. You keep the same name. You maybe even keep some of the same properties. But it's an entirely different religion that believes different things. Astounding. And the Lord said, this is a great evil. Once you reject the truth, you will follow a lie. Once you reject scriptural faith, you will invent an unscriptural one. Once you reject the real Messiah, you will cook up a different one. Ultimately, they'll follow the Antichrist. Israel will make a covenant with death, and if the real Jesus didn't come back and save them, they'd be exterminated. That's the second evil. One evil, two evils. Two weeks ago, I was in an area of London, speaking at Woodbury Baptist Church next to an ultra-Orthodox Jewish neighborhood called Stamford Hill. Stamford Hill is where Hasidic Jews live. The people with the black hats and the peyote, the ear curls, and so forth. And they follow different rebbies, tzaddiks. They practice Kabbalah, mystical Judaism. They believe in numerology, reincarnation, all kinds of things that come from Babylonian Gnosticism that they call Judaism. They believe crazy things. They believe that God is the Ein Sof. He has no essence, only attributes. He's lost his identity, and they have to help him capture it again by capturing things called zoom zooms, holy sparks. When you see them davening like this and twirling their ears, they're trying to capture these holy sparks so God can regain his identity. Now these manifestations of the Ein Sof come from not the, the, what Gnostics call demiurges. It's the same thing. This comes from Babylonian Gnosticism. This is Kabbalah. There's a cheap Hollywood version of it that the people who practice the real thing would make fun of. The Madonna version is not real Kabbalah. Real Kabbalah, you have to be a 40-year-old married Jewish male who's ultra-Orthodox. They wouldn't let Madonna practice real Kabbalah. These people are crazy. They believe crazy things, all kinds of things. They believe there was a Jewish Frankenstein called the Golem in Prague. And it always perverts scripture. The origins of these things, again, are always in Babylon, always in Eastern religion. All false religion emanates from Babylon ontogenetically. That's where it comes from. We read about this in the book of Isaiah. Isaiah says, my people are filled with influences from the east. From the east. Well, and they think it's Judaism. Dressing in these black suits, it doesn't matter where you see them. You can see them in Antwerp, Belgium, which is the diamond center of Europe. They're in the diamond trade. You see them in the Catskill Mountains in New York and Brooklyn and Meir Sharim in Jerusalem or B'nai Brak near Tel Aviv. You can see them in Stamford Hill in London. No matter where you see them, they're always the same. They live in a shtetl, like a Jewish ghetto from Fiddler on the Roof. That's their mentality. They're very similar to the Amish. You know how the Amish think it's 1699 and they try to live as if it was 1699? These people are the same way. They're trying to live like it's the 1700s in Lithuania or something. And you know how the Amish are superstitious where they put the hexagrams on the barns? The same thing, the superstition, the evil eye, the whole thing. Very much the same as the, the, the Pennsylvania Dutch. Well, crazy! And they call it Judaism. And these are the most the most orthodox Jews. They run around with signs, we want Mashiach now, we want Messiah now. You see posters in Jerusalem, we want the Messiah now. Mashiach, 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 yay, yeah, yay, yeah, yay. Yeah. They sing it all the time. Well, they're going to get, the, having rejected the true Mashiach, the true Messiah, you know who they're going to follow. Jesus told us in John chapter 5, 
I come in my name, you don't believe me. If another comes in his own name, him you shall believe. They followed many false messiahs. When you reject the true one, you get another one. They followed Bar Kokhba in the second century from a prophecy in Numbers chapter 6. They followed Jacob Frank and Shabbat Taisfi, who turned respectively to Islam and Roman Catholicism. Then, in the 1990s, they said it was Menachem Schneerson, the Lubavitch rabbi from Brooklyn. <laughs> when you reject the true Messiah, you'll get a false one. They have a vigil at the grave of Menachem Schneerson. Because they believe you can't go to God directly, you have to go through their rabbi called the Rebbe. He has the spirit of the Hasidic movement's founder called the Beshk, an acronym for Baal Shem Tov, and he's reincarnated in the Rebbe. But there's different sects of Hasidim. They fight with each other over whose Rebbe has the real spirit of the Beshk. Some of them tuck their trousers in, some put their curls on back of the ears, some in front. These are uniforms to know which sect they're in. Lubavitch or Satmar or Babov, they, they look the same to non-Jews, but when you, understand, you know the Jewish community, you can tell who they're following. It's crazy, it's cultic, it's insane. And the history of what they've done is unbelievable. They widely believed that Shabbat Taisfi was the Messiah. And they said, you must know the depth of sin to know the depth of redemption. Now that's the truth. Jesus, the real Messiah, he who knew no sin became sin. He took ours. It's the truth. But having rejected him, they literally went out at the behest of their Messiah at the time, and they had public sex orgies in the village squares in Poland in front of the Gentiles, the presence of Gentiles, to, to demonstrate they knew the depths of sin so that they would know the depths of redemption. That's how crazy they became. Utterly, utterly nuts. You'll see women, pr pr pretty young girls for their wedding, will shave their heads and wear wigs for the rest of their married life. All these traditions that have nothing whatsoever to do with the Word of God. Nothing! You can tell if a woman is married or not if she has hair, if she's had a shaved head or not. If she's been scalped, she's married. If she's not, she's single. There was a pogrom when Jewish women were being raped 300 years ago or something, or 250 years ago, so the rabbi told, shave the women's heads so it'll be unattractive to the pogromists. And so to commemorate these women, they all shaved their heads to this. It's, this is crazy. The things they teach in their yeshivas, their religious schools, are unbelievable. You have to have as many babies as possible. They, they have families, eight, nine, ten kids. They, they breed like rabbits because in case one of the kids is the Messiah, one of the boys. They tell yeshiva boys in their yeshivas, in their religious schools, Masturbation is a sin because you might preempt the conception of the Mashiach, of the Messiah. This is how they think. This is how they think. They live in a different world than other Jews. In Israel, they look upon secular Jews <laughs> the way they used to look upon Gentiles in the diaspora. Their neighborhoods are the shtetls, the ghettos, <laughs> apart from mainstream Israel. And they think this is Judaism. All they have is a broken cistern. Even some of their synagogues on the ceiling have the word Echavod, Ichabod, the glory has departed. It can't hold the Spirit of God. It's bankrupt. As I've explained in one of my recorded teachings, Talmudic Judaism was found by a classmate of St. Paul from the school of Hillel. It was founded by Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and developed over the centuries from there. You look in the Torah, there's no synagogue, there's no rabbi. 
<laughs> the Messiah had to come and die before the second temple would be destroyed, according to Daniel 9. Bet Midrash Shinit, Zeo, Mashiach Yitzarek Lavo, Velamut Livneha Horban Shara Bet Midrash Shinit. They freak out, they can't handle Daniel 9. I had a rabbi debate me in New York once, he was freaking out. He said, show me a better source than Daniel. I said, you want a better source than somebody you just admitted was a prophet of God? What they believe is this. The Hebrew prophets were only messengers. They delivered the message. The rabbis or the ga'onim have to, have to interpret the message. So the opinion, the opinion of a thousand and one rabbis outweighs the opinion of a thousand prophets. It's based on something that Jesus condemned as teaching as precepts of God, the inventions of men, known as the oral law. In Hebrew, ha-torah be'al peh. Well, you can easily, easily demolish Talmudic Judaism with one verse. There is one verse that causes Talmudic Judaism to fold like a cheap suit. One verse. They say the oral law was given on Mount Sinai. It wasn't written down till late. It was written by somebody called Yehuda Hanasi in the second century after Christ. But, but it was given on Mount Sinai through Moses. That's their basis. God gave it through Moses. Look at the book of Joshua, chapter 8. Verse 35, there was not a word of all that Moses had commanded, which Joshua did not read before the assembly of Israel, <laughs> with the women and the little ones and the strangers who were living among them. That one verse demolishes Talmudic Judaism, better called Rabbinism. It's not real Judaism. Levitical Judaism has not existed since 70 A.D. in accordance with the prophecies of Jesus and Daniel. Now, is there a legitimate Judaism today? Yes, there is. Do we have any Jewish believers in Jesus here today? Any Jews who believe? Okay. Jew. You want to see a Jew who believes? That's real Judaism. The natural branches of the church and the faithful remnant of Israel. Born again Jews are for this time in history what the 7,000 who didn't bow the knee to Baal were for Elijah's day. They are the natural branches of the church. That is real Judaism, messianic Judaism. That is scriptural, that is valid, that is true Judaism. The natural branches of the church, the faithful remnant of Israel, the believing Jews, that's real Judaism. The rest is a broken cistern, spiritually bankrupt. It cannot hold any water. It's rabbinism, it's not Judaism. They might have got the properties, they might have got the name. They can call themselves Judaism, but when you read the scriptures, you see it isn't. They got a different Messiah. They got a different word of God. They do teach the scriptures to little kids, they call it Chemish. They simply use the Torah, the Pentateuch, to teach little kids how to read Hebrew. They speak Yiddish as their main language. The way the Pennsylvania Dutch speak High German, they speak a dialect of German called Yiddish. Hebrews for religious purposes, and they, they, they teach the little kids to read it. By teaching the, the, the Torah is like, see spot, see Jane run, that, that's the Torah to them. The real thing is what the rabbis say, the Talmud. It's a broken cistern. It's spiritually bankrupt. Look, find another name for it. Don't call it Judaism. If you want to believe that, you can believe that. But please find another name for it. Call it rabbinism. Please don't call it Judaism. The broken system. Well, that's the people. What about those who profess to be the children? 
Find me purgatory in the New Testament. At the first church council, James presided, not Peter. Paul rebuked Peter in the presence of all, and Peter just identified himself as your fellow elder. He claimed no primacy. Please find me a pope in the New Testament. Find me rosary beads or a scapula. Find me mass cards. I can find mandatory celibacy, but St. Paul says that's a doctrine of demons. At least it's in there. <laughs> Look, Roman Catholicism find another name for it. It's the pontifical religions of pagan Rome. Call it what it is. Don't call it Christianity. Find another name for it. His blood cleanses from all sin. You don't atone in purgatory for your own. Turn with me to Galatians 1. Verse 6. I'm amazed you are so quickly deserting him who called you by the grace of Christ for a different gospel, which is really not another one, only there's some who are disturbing you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you the gospel contrary to what you've preached, he is anathema, accursed of God. If you believe you have to atone for your own sin in purgatory, or after you're dead, people can get you out with mass cards, you are the curse of God. Find another name for it. Oh, we believe Jesus died for our sins? Yeah, and you're going to burn for your fry for your own. Why did he have to die? You're accursed of God. It's an accursed religious system. People who are in it are accursed. It's not what I say. It's a different gospel. It is a broken cistern. Having rejected the true Messiah, they get another one, a piece of bread and a cup of wine. The Eucharistic Christ. They say he returns physically transubstantiated. You reject the true Messiah, you get another one. They too will follow Antichrist. Guaranteed. They've got their broken system. Broken system. Can't hold any water. It's useless. <laughs> That's not the worst. Liberal Protestantism is worse. You read a Roman Catholic theological book. They're usually written by Jesuits, and the author has S.J. after his name, Society of Jesus. They'll always be imprimatur and have an eyelid obstat. At least officially, you will not find a Roman Catholic theologian denying the historicity of the resurrection of the virgin birth. You go to Yale Divinity School, <laughs> or any one of those institutions, you'll find plenty of liberal Protestant theologians who don't believe in the historicity of the resurrection or a literal virgin birth. Mainstream Protestantism is worse than what it set out to reform. They've got a historical Jesus who's some kind of a social reformer. Period. End of story. You reject the true Christ, you've got another one. They draw a distinction between the Jesus of history and the Jesus of faith. That's what liberal Protestantism teaches. 
The one who walked on the water, that's the Jesus of faith. This other guy who was just a social reformer and stuff, that's the Jesus of history. That's the They've got another Christ. They've got another religion. The World Council of Churches. Okay, that's what you want to believe, or I should say that's what you don't want to believe. That's up to you. But find another name for it. Find another name for your broken cistern that can hold no water. It doesn't matter. Take your pick. The Eastern Orthodox tradition teaches theosis. God becomes one with man so man can be one with God. So far, so good. You achieve this by praying through an icon which has a metaphysical power and property to enter the spiritual realm through a graven image. Oh. <laughs> Plus the sacramentalism on top of it. That's the Eastern Orthodox. That's your religion, that's your religion. But don't call it Christianity. You shall not make a graven image of anything on heaven above or earth beneath. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. Find another name for it. Broken cisterns. We can go on and on. You can pick any of them. They come in the name of Judaism or Christianity, Judeo-Christian faiths that are not scriptural. You know, at one time, let's go back to when I was first saved in the 1970s, things were a lot more cut and dry. They were a lot more straightforward. There were people who were born again and those who weren't, and the ones who were born again knew the difference. Evangelical meant something, evangelion. It was like Israel and Judah. The 10 northern tribes were backslidden, but you had revivals of the kings like Hezekiah and Josiah and Asa in Judah. So Judah had the house of David. They were the faithful Jews. The ones up north were the backslidden. So you had evangelical and nominal. Okay. When you said Babylon or something like that as a religious metaphor among believers in the 1970s even, Pentecostals, Baptist brethren, they would have known you were talking about the Roman Church or the Greek Orthodox Church or, or, or the liberal Protestants or the World Council of Churches or the cults like Jehovah's Witnesses or Mormons or something like that. They would have known that was Babylon. <laughs> they would have known that. The average believer would have understood that. Now, you talk about Babylon, you can be talking about the assemblies of God. You ever seen film clips of what they did in Pensacola? There was not just anybody. They done the same thing. They hijacked the name and took the properties. Did the same thing as the Jews? They took the name and the property, but they're a different religion with very different beliefs than the early Pentecostals. I'm a great admirer of John Wesley. I've said this many times. Nobody in their right mind can imagine the Methodist churches of today being what John Wesley taught by and large. And the same has become very true for most Baptists certainly in Britain and many Baptists in America. They got the name. They got the buildings. But what they believe is no longer scriptural. They get another Jesus. A Jesus who would turn water into wine at same-sex marriages. I'm talking about 
about people who say they're saved. I'm talking about Brian McLaren, the guru of the emergent church. I'm talking about Eugene Peterson. With his heretical mistranslation of the scripture, the message, Rick Warren's Bible of choice. Three weeks ago, he said he would perform a same-sex marriage at his Presbyterian church in Oregon. Yeah, Tony Campolo and his son Bart. Jesus would perform a same-sex marriage. He'd change water into wine at a gay wedding. A lesbian one. Look, Tony Campolo, Brian McLaren, Eugene Peterson. If that's what you believe, that's what you believe. But please find another name for it. Do not call it Christianity, and please do not call it evangelical Christianity. You do not believe the Evangelion. You have a different gospel and a different Jesus. Your church is a broken cistern. The Spirit of God is not in it anymore. You've committed two evils. You've rejected the real Jesus and you made cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Look at what has happened to Calvary Chapel in Costa Mesa. Look at what has happened to the Grace Brethren. They're all going. Oh, Chuck Smith was a man of God, certainly was. He was a friend of mine. I knew him, he was a man of God. John Wesley was a man of God. Charles Spurgeon was a man of God. You might have got the name, you might have the property, but you don't believe the same things and you don't have the same Jesus anymore. I talked about this, perhaps you've heard me say it. I was just in Australia three weeks ago, home of Hillsong. One financial and sexual scandal after another. Islam is the same God as Christians and Jews, the rest of it. They had their women's conference in New York. Jesus comes out just like the Statue of Liberty in female drag with the crown, instead of the crown of thorns, the crown of Lady Liberty. And they're singing the Frank Sinatra song, New York, New York, that's worship. Then they bring out the naked cowboy. A guy standing there on a platform, choreographed with pyrotechnics, all these two, 3,000 Christian women clapping and cheering, the, the naked cowboy, and he's standing there with cowboy boots, a guitar, and a cowboy hat. And they call this worship. He was the youth minister of Hillsong, New York. When they asked Carl Lynn, the pastor of Hillsong, New York, or they asked Brian Houston's wife, Bobby, who was the keynote speaker about this, oh God, you wouldn't believe the double talk. It was choreographed, it was pre-planned, it was pyrotechnics. Of course, he wouldn't condemn homosexuality either when interviewed on CNN. Look, Hillsong, okay. I got no problem with the name Hillsong. But don't call a music industry a music ministry and don't call your beliefs Christianity. The spirit of Jesus is not in it. The spirit of Jesus is not in Mars Hill. The spirit of Jesus is not in Redding, California with that mystic Gnostic. The spirit of Jesus is not in the new apostolic reformation. Please, he's not in the ecumenical movement. The real Jesus is this one. Find another name for it. You can believe what you want to believe, but find another name for it. My people have committed two evils. They've forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, saith the Lord. 
to who for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. My children have done the same. A broken water container devoid of the Spirit of God. Several weeks ago, I was in Vietnam. We have a ministry that we don't talk about much with the underground church in Vietnam. I was talking to the pastors through an interpreter, and I asked these men, and it's such a humbling experience. How many of you brethren, these are pastors, have been in prison for your faith? <laughs> Most of them. Some of them have been tortured. They took this one guy who came to hear me speak. They arrested him for 18 days, knocked all of his teeth out so people would see what would happen to Christian pastors. Then they let him go, and then they locked him up again. I was there about five, six months ago. There was a guy saved one month. They burned his house. Him and one child got out. Another believer, his wife, and four of his children were burned to death. Burned to death! Don't tell them about pre-trib rapture. <laughs> They're in trip. But you know what? And I'm not exaggerating. Their churches are growing. Their churches are growing. And they're not growing by people leaving church A for church B or transfer growth. They're growing by people being saved. I was at a meeting one time over there. My interpreter came and said, you got to get out of here. The police came. They took the pastor and locked the... Hey, it was a mess. I was all right. But see, the most is going to happen to me is I'm going to get deported. The poor locals. <laughs> Anyways, I go to China. I go to these places. I've been to Saudi Arabia. Look, you know. Those churches... All they've got is a rusty old bucket. That's their church. It's a rusty old bucket. But there's no holes in it. It holds the living water. They've got persecution. They've got poverty. They don't have anything but trouble. But they've got their real Jesus. They've got their real living water. You might have noticed, I'm stumbling around, but I rarely use crutches now. I asked those pastors who were in prison to pray for my legs so I could walk. They did. And I'm walking without crutches. I mean, I'm not cured, but I'm walking. I couldn't do that. Yeah, rusty bucket. Those Hmong people, and Nam had a rusty bucket of a church. Poverty, persecution, they had nothing but trouble. A rusty bucket of a church. But it was filled to the brim with the living water. They didn't lose a drop. There was no holes in it. These nonsense things you see, New Apostolic Reformation, Toronto, Pensacola, Lakeland, and all of this counterfeit revivals, and this stupid garbage, Mars Hill, and all of this. <laughs> all they've got is a broken sister. <laughs> Maybe a sister, but there's no water in it. The naked cowboy, Jesus and female drag is the Statue of Liberty. Does anybody in their right mind think that's the Spirit of God? Even the world knows it's crazy. Even the world knows they're nuts. Yeah. I see the church in a broken cistern. 
But I testify to you before the Lord Jesus, I have seen the church of the rusty bucket. <laughs> I know where the living water is. I know who has it. And I know who doesn't. A broken sister. My people, my people, my family of Israeli Jews, I grieve over the unbelief of Israel. I grieve in my soul every day for the unbelief of Israel and the Jews. Not a day of my life goes by where I do not grieve in my spirit for the salvation of Israel. But the church... You'd expect the church would know better. At least the New Testament says, because of Israel, it's supposed to. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. Verse 6, these things happened as examples to Israel. For us, so we would not do the same things. Verse 11, these things happened to them as examples, were written for our instruction. The sin, the unbelief, the apostasy of Israel was written so believers would not make the same mistakes. Now there's more to it than that, obviously, but that's the reason from the perspective of the church. That's why we primarily study the Old Testament to learn from Israel. Well, his people did it. And his children have not turned out to be too much different or too much better. Quite a thing. The church of the broken cistern in the church of the rusty bucket. I have seen both. I pointed this out many times. I have met true believers, true Christians in Ohio. I have met true Christians in Australia. I have met true Christians in Great Britain, in New Zealand. I've met true Christians in Europe and in Canada. I've met true Christians in many countries. But if you want to see true Christianity, come with me to China. <laughs> come with me to Vietnam. Come to me to the slums in the Philippines. I'll show you real Christianity. I'll show you the Book of Acts. All you're going to see is a rusty bucket. But what's in it is the real deal. They don't need counterfeit revivals based on hype and manipulation. They've got the real thing. That's the way it is. An astounding verse, Jeremiah 2.13. Two evils. They've rejected the real Jesus and invented another religion. Now it's come to the church. They've rejected the real Jesus and invented another religion. I don't know what else I can say. I'm only telling you what I've seen and what I've experienced and what I know to be true on the basis of Scripture. I thank God you have a nice place to meet and the heat and the winter and the air conditioning in the summer and your coffee and all of that. I go to places where they, they get little cups of rice with chopsticks and, grab, and they're sleeping on mats. I'm not opposed to these things. But what the Western church largely is, is Laodicea. Laodicea. I've been to Smyrna. 
<laughs> I've been to Smyrna. I've been to Philadelphia. I've been to the real church. You know, one time here in the American Midwest, there were men like D.O. Moody and Harry Ironside. There were men like that. And they preached the truth. They bequeathed the heritage that sent missionaries to these other countries. Now I think those other countries ought to send missionaries to us. <laughs> I'm just being honest. Yeah. Broken cisterns. Now I'm not saying that that is this church. I'm not saying it is every church. There were faithful people in the days of Jeremiah. And there are faithful people today. And I thank God for them. There are those who uphold the truth. That is true. But they're not the mainstream anymore. They're the minority. That's all they are. No. There is a faithful remnant in Laodicea, Jesus said so. Those whom he loves, he corrects. After you've been to Smyrna, after you've seen the persecuted church, after you've seen the reality of what it means to believe in Christ and the price that people are paying for it right now as we speak, <laughs> yeah, nothing but a rusty bucket. <laughs> rusty bucket. The bucket is rusty, but the water is real. God bless.